Hey, I'm Chris Paris with Oak Harvest Financial Group in Houston, Texas. And this is our third episode where we're grilling with the investment team. So we've got a special treat this week. Uh, it's not just me. We've got one of our members on the investment team, Dwayne Bachok. He's in from Atlanta for two weeks helping out. So I figured he'd come over to my house and help me out here on the grill. He's looking at buying a new uh, pellet grill. So I'm showing what I've got and how it works versus the Kamados here that I also have. So glad you could join us. And we're going to talk a little bit of grilling, but a lot about the investment process at Oak Harvest and mainly what uh, Dwayne brings to the team because we've been friends now for almost 20 years. Yeah. This is the second time Dwayne and myself have worked together. Charles, myself, and, and Dwayne worked together way back when, uh, like Char Charles and I talk about back in the days at AIM. So let's get to the grilling first, get that out of the way, then we can talk the investment management process with uh, Oak Harvest. We're four hours into the grill, and I'm doing a little of everything today for the, the office. We've got the pork shoulder over here, pork butt, um, and then we have two racks of St. Louis ribs. St. Louis ribs are a little uh, uh, fattier than pork ribs, pork loin ribs, so they take a little longer. So I put those on first. Um, over here is a rack of pork loin ribs, also called baby back ribs. Um, that I'm going to dress up and put those on. So they take less time because they don't have as much uh, marbling, as much fat. Um, they tend to dry out if you cook them six hours. These, uh, these ribs here, these St. Louis ribs, these uh, baby, not baby back, these, um, these are St. Louis. These will take up, up to six hours. So this pork shoulder is going to be up to 10 hours. It's on there four right now. So let me go ahead and do the next uh, step in the process, which is to... Uh, Get, uh, why don't you ask Dwayne for a little help here? Dwayne, can you grab me this uh, tin over here? Yep. Um, the next four hours on this pork shoulder, since we're going low and slow, are going to be wrapped. If you could hand me that, uh, give me that, yeah, the, give me the, nope, okay. give me the sauce that you have in your hand here. So this is a tequila habanero lime sauce. I'm not going to use a lot, um, just a little bit to give it a little moisture. Um, I need to do one thing here. Um, I need to flip these in. So what I'm going to do here is just put a little bit on top. And then we were actually drinking a, drinking a beer here before we started rolling. And I could use a little of that beer right now. Hey, Dwayne, can you grab me uh, one of those waters sure. um, behind you? Um, because what we need is this is going to go low and slow with all this here for another four hours plus. So we're kind of almost you know, braising it and steaming it. So it's going to congeal the fat and the tissue on the inside that makes it tough. And uh, I am looking for foil, which I do not have here. So I'm going to use the uh, butcher paper. Hopefully that works out. Uh, might not. It'll work out on the ribs. I don't know if this will work out that well. Hold on one second here. And what you need is you need foil to wrap this. Take that away. Well, this is the third time we've done this. Made enchiladas, I think it was last time. Mole enchiladas. It was a big hit online. It was a big hit in the office. So that'll. this is going to be on another probably four hours plus. These ribs over here, I need to wrap. Why don't you give me that other sauce here? And ooh, those are getting those are getting good already. I could yeah, feel I could feel them jiggle. Yeah, they look good. Yeah, they they're looking good. Look at the great uh, reddish color on there from the rub and the smoke. And I'm just going to use a little bit of this. This is a different rib sauce that one of the fellow folks at Oak Harvest gave me as a gift one year. So I'm gonna put a little of that. These will only take probably another two hours maybe at the most. The way they feel right now, they might be done in they might be done in an hour. So you could eat them right now. They just be, will be a little tough. You want to get all this pork up to around 203 degrees. That's where all the fat congeals into liquid and uh, becomes mouth-watering, uh, great 
great pork. So let me do this. And you're putting that in the paper as opposed to the aluminum foil. Yeah, I'm putting this in the, so the aluminum foil tends to hold more moisture. Uh, yeah. And so this has longer to go. It'll accelerate the process with the foil. The butcher's paper lets things breathe. Yeah. Um, these are, you know, the ribs are more delicate than the pork shoulder there. So I don't want to steam these. I don't want these to be, I don't, I don't want all that goodness leaking out of it into the foil on the ribs. Um, got some habaneros and serranos here that I will probably end up putting on this uh, other pork loin rib. And so this pork loin rib hasn't even been on the grill yet. But you can tell, those were flatter and fattier. These are nice and thick. This is more like a pork tenderloin. You know, not a lot of marbling, not a lot of fat. Um, people who don't like that juicy bite, but love the taste of barbecued pork, will love the baby back ribs here. So I'm just gonna put that on right now and start that up, close this up, and we can get on to talking to Dwayne. I'm gonna put these on top here, because there's a couple people in the office that really like spice and I'll just smoke those like that. And uh, we'll be having this for lunch tomorrow across the, the company. I haven't even told them yet. I usually call it Meek Monday <laughs> and send out an email to people. Surprise. And uh, yeah, tomorrow's gonna be a surprise. So let's go ahead and close this up. I'll set the timer. We're smoking at 250 here. Initially, set it was on smoke. Uh, I did that for almost two hours. Turned it up to 250. If it starts to go really slow, I'll probably even turn it up to 275 just to accelerate the process because that pork shoulder may be on here a long time and I don't want it being on here at 10 o'clock at night when I'm sleeping. So um, done here on the grill. And uh, if anyone has an interest locally in, in Houston with wanting to buy a Kamado, a used one, I've got two. So I am looking to sell this one. This is, this is a Big Joe orig original model right over here. It's clean. It's fantastic. I just got envy and had to buy a newer model. Like some people buy new cars, I buy <laughs> smokers. So let's go ahead and close this up and uh, we're gonna find some chairs, sit down and talk with Dwayne about um, him getting back together with the team and his role at Oak Harvest uh, on the investment management team. Investors, thanks for joining me again. This is the third of our series uh, where you join me from my kitchen, whether it's out here by the, the grills or in the kitchen where I was making chicken uh, moles. Uh, a couple months ago. But people have asked me, hey, Chris, I love this series that you're doing on barbecuing, but what in the world does um, you cooking in a kitchen have to do with investment management? And I was trying to think about that. And I'm like, wow, you're right. Besides just getting to know me and the rest of the team, I started thinking of you know, the kitchen in a professional kitchen. Um, if you go watch the cooking network and the uh, you know, kitchen network, um, those kitchens are highly tuned organizations and they're, everyone's got a job and they're different levels. And, and our investment team at Oak Harvest has gone from two people. Um, James was the original one. Then I came in about six years ago and we just hired Charles almost exactly a year ago and brought in two additional team members in the last six plus months, including Dwayne here, who uh, Charles and I worked with years ago. So um, I don't know if you wanted to think of the hierarchy at Oak Harvest from a kitchen standpoint, you probably have Troy and Jessica as executive chefs where they're in charge of the, the vision for the company, but they're not managing the money, right? They've, they've hired a team to manage the money. So you've got the next level of um, chef de cuisine, who's probably Charles and myself, who are actually you know, managing the portfolios and stuff. But you also have people that you aren't connected with directly, you haven't seen on YouTube or in the live streams, like um, Dwayne here or James or Chris. And they're an integral part of the team and they all have uh, very specialized jobs, but we as a team couldn't do our jobs without them. And so Dwayne's here in town for two weeks. Um, he usually works two weeks in Atlanta, two weeks here in, in Houston. And so we got him for two weeks and he wanted to come over and check out my grills. And I said, you know what, we're going to put you on uh, YouTube this week too. <laughs> so um, Dwayne, it's great to have you here. Thanks and, you know, can you go back a little history of, you know, how myself and Charles got to know you and your job you know, previously and what you're doing for us now. Sure, sure. First of all, thanks for uh, making lunch for me three times last week. I was eating what he made last weekend all this past week. So thanks for that. So uh, but yeah, I, I started off at uh, AIM in the operations department and I kind of uh, 
in that operations department, uh, working on 401ks, 403b administration and processing, developed a penchant for working with Excel and automation with VBA code within Excel. So I kind of just got really curious in it and really started looking into it more and more and became better and better at doing it. And before I knew it, all the, the operations department was asking me for advice on how to move data to a certain spot or calculate something or uh, just get something in one general area to another. And so that kind of blossomed into me moving into the marketing team. And uh, I was in the marketing team for three years and I actually ended up uh, leading a marketing information technology team uh, the last year I was on that, on that specific uh, group. And uh, so basically, uh, it just kind of blossomed from there where I just did you know, even more types of automation. And it got really into the analytics as well, doing competitor analysis. And you know, at the end of the, my stay in the marketing group, uh, I ran a team of five people. And we, I created a system that basically, for a 400 person marketing team, served, uh, yes, uh, served up all of our information on our funds and how their performance was relative to our competitors and you know, how our style analysis compared to all of our competitors and that type of thing. I, I, yeah. I can't, I can't so, remember, um, was your initial education in computer science? Or no, it was in business finance. Business finance. And okay. as part of that, I'd use Excel a lot, right. of course. And you know, Excel's got this hook of using a VBA as an, uh, a programming language that sits behind it. So I was just kind of self-taught with tons of books that were stacked on my desk where I would go through and learn it all. Just, so. just to let you know, as far as self-taught, <laughs> Dwayne is the most amazing self-taught. <laughs> Um, you know, generally, most people would call him a quant nowadays yeah. um, on our team. That's what he is. But he's more than that. Um, so, you know, Charles has talked about SMR um, and quantum mental. Without Dwayne, um, quantum mental is really hard to do because if you think about there's 10,000 stocks out there and each stock has, you know, a thousand pieces of data or something like that, trying to assimilate and process and make decisions on that is nearly impossible for five people without someone like Dwayne on the team who has the expertise to uh, take the information that the team wants, um, organize it um, in, a, in a manner that you can crunch the numbers and then disseminate it to the rest of the team to make decisions. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when you think about it, there's just tons and tons of information coming in at the same time. You have to find a way to assimilate that make sense of it and condense it down so that it's usable, right? Because everybody has access to that information in some way or, or fashion, right? So that's, that's kind of like, uh, you know, the, the step to make everything efficient is, you know, that's my kind of uh, role in the team, one of the roles. So yeah. when, when I was working at AIM back with Charles a long, long time ago, um, Dwayne was brought in by, by Charles, yep. um, saw his value to the, the team, the ops team, and the team that was running Constellation at the time, from a quantitative standpoint of building tools that the portfolio managers, myself, Charles, some of the other guys um, could use to crunch loads of data. And the great thing about Dwayne is you give him an idea and he goes and runs with it and comes back with 10 times <laughs> the usefulness as far as the answer, right? Yeah. And he won't just give you the answer that you asked for, he'll go beyond that and you know, answer questions that you haven't thought of yet, which is just, it's phenomenal. Right. So, yeah. Um, can you, can you uh, tell me a little bit about, so I left AIM, Charles left AIM, uh, we went and were managing money elsewhere. What, uh, what did you do? Yeah, so uh, after you, you two departed, I moved over to the quantitative team and I worked there for two years. Uh, as part of the quantitative team, I got to get a really good insight into what all the different managers around the firm were doing, how they were screening for stocks, and help them build tools to manage their portfolios. So I got a little bit of a different flavor from what other people were doing. And then um, after working on the quantitative team, I started gravitating to more and more special projects as well, working for other managers doing uh, quantitative projects with them. And in particular, I started working even more and more with the uh, trading desk, uh, analyzing transaction costs. And this was back before you, you, you basically transaction costs look basically in, uh, amounted to just looking at the volume weighted average price. And that was the transaction cost back then. So I was trying to take it to the next level. And what I was able to develop was a system internally that, that was totally developed in-house that allowed all of the traders to look at their transaction costs, you know, almost real time and see how they did versus all these other different uh, 
benchmarks that you can use within transaction cost analysis and it'd basically be a feedback loop to help them improve their trading. And so the head of the trading desk uh, liked that, so I eventually got promoted to the global head of uh, transaction cost analysis on the capital markets tr trading desk. The trading is you know, underneath that as far as uh, organizationally. So uh, when I left AIM, it, was, it basically had grown to about 100 plus people in that capital markets desk. But I kind of served as the go-to person for a lot of our automation, analytics, and you know, obviously transaction cost analysis, uh, deep dives and that kind of thing. And it, 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 it just so happens that, um, so Charles came into Oak Harvest almost exactly a year ago now um, with the idea of continuing to expand our strategies. So the idea was we were gonna launch a uh, mutual fund and it was gonna have a same long, short, hedged equity strategy that we had to aim at the AIM Ops funds that we eventually ran three and a half billion in. Charles and I are working and we, we both have a ton of experience in managing money, um, but we don't have the experience in a quantitative role, building and assimilating massive amounts of data um, through pipes. Um, we, you know, we had, a, we had a staff of probably 2,000 people or whatever the number was at AIM that did that behind us. We just had to run the money and other people did that. And so we were kind of sitting there one day uh, nine months ago, I guess, something like yeah. that. And, uh, we're, and Charles and I are both like, yeah, I wonder what Dwayne's doing. And it just so <laughs> happened, um, Charles' wife and all her wisdom were like, just call him, you know, just get on the phone and call him. And I think Charles might have gone on to LinkedIn and kind of, uh, you know, spied on, spied on Dwayne first and realized that he had just semi-retired from yeah. AIM. <laughs> um, so Charles gave Dwayne a call. Right. And then now I'm back on the team. And he's, he's, he's back on the team. So as, <laughs> as I've said before, we're trying to get the band back together. So right now we have Charles, myself, and Dwayne. One of the little known facts, so we use Bloomberg as our main data source for yeah. particularly for the single stock portfolios that we run right now, which are uh, growth stocks as well as dividend growth stocks, but also this long, short, hedged um, equity strategy that we just launched at the beginning of the year, which if you want some information on that, you can go to oakharvestfunds.com. We'll be doing some videos on it in the future. We just have to, we have to get those videos and that information right for you and, and in compliance, um, given it is, a, it is a security, considered a security. But a little known fact about Dwayne is back when he was with AIM, um, he broke Bloomberg essentially way back <laughs> in the day. Um, can you say a little bit about, yeah, about I think, that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you pull too much information on Bloomberg, apparently a flag goes up. So I was trying to assimilate a, lot, a large amount of data for all of us to use, and uh, one of the Bloomberg reps came through and said, "What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> something, uh, something uh, looks uh, like something's going wrong. It's blowing up the system." So, uh, so uh, before it was, <laughs> before it was, I hate to say this, sexy to be a quant. You know, <laughs> Dwayne was Dwayne was on top of it, and he That's is right. a unbelievable asset that we have at Oak Harvest. You don't see him on the live streams yet. You don't see him on YouTube. This is his first time. He was a little apprehensive about coming on. <laughs> like, listen, Eric's Eric's a pro behind the camera. Um, he can edit it out anything that we don't <laughs> like. And I'm cr sure Corinne will give us a great thumbnail um, for the release when it comes out next week. So um, do you have any questions on the markets or anything, Eric? You know, while we're not talking about Dwayne's great bio or the barbecue behind us? Yeah, yeah. how can I get rich quick? How can you get rich <laughs> quick? <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. If I did, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you. So, um, you know, Warren Buffett and and others. I think it was Albert. Was it Albert Einstein who said mm -hmm. compound interest is the like eighth wonder of the world or uh. something like that? And, and Warren Buffett stands by that. And it it's true. I mean, just it's just math that you know compounding without taking gains. If you can find those stocks that can compound your money and re by compounding reinvest it wisely um, over a decade or multi decades, that's the best way. There is no get rich, you know, so, so alchemy. The big question is, um, you know, like you look at NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is like, what, $900 a share now? Yes. So, so how do you find a company? Like, how do you know a company is going to do that? So NVIDIA is a great, uh, a great question because NVIDIA came public in... 99. 1999, yeah. in the middle of 1999. And um, some of my prior videos here in the last year, in fact, over the last 15 months, have talked about the dot-com bubble have specifically talked about NVIDIA when other people last year were calling it a bubble. I'm like, even if it is a bubble, it's not even close to being the top. NVIDIA has been around now for, you know, 10 plus, well, longer than that, 20 years. So, um, you know, I, I can't tell you 
what to do with NVIDIA or the other semiconductor stocks right now. NVIDIA did almost hit $1,000 on Friday. Um, it's up, I think, six-fold maybe in the last year or something like that because their business is up you know, almost that much. But if and when the next recession comes, instead of panicking and trying to sell all your stocks, go look for the, the gems out there that have new technology um, that, you know, have the chance to grow. And because yep. NVIDIA, you know, NVIDIA had to go through the great financial crisis. You know, it went yep. through the dot-com bubble bursting. And, you know, it's one of those kind of sole survivors, but it's... Um, it can be done. You can you can find those gems, and you know we're looking to do that with help of Dwayne and the help yeah. of his system. Yeah, because you know you really want to process, right? So you, you don't want to just go willy nilly and you know like oh let's let's figure out what to buy. So what we have is a process that we've employed. So it's SMR, sales margins, return on invested capital, and so we can run back test of screens and you know uh, all this type of stuff. And for our strategies, we can do the reverse of that to pull in ideas for our short side. So. That's of course not the end all be all. You still takes you know a fine tooth comb with you and Charles and the team going through, and really digging down, listening to conference calls. That's just the starting starting point, really, right? So we take that next step down and and really get, use other inputs of technology on top of that. Um, but what we've built is this ent entire business intelligence system that takes our long screens, our short screens, all of the data. For all, every name in the you know the, the universe that we're looking at, the, the entire equity universe, and you know crushes it down to where we can see, you know where they overlap and which ones have certain amounts of risk different based on certain measures and all sorts of key metrics that we'd want to look at, and that helps narrow the field visually with all this business intelligence software that we use, and so we can make better decisions in a quicker manner. Yeah. So, and, and a, a word of warning to uh, given where we are in the cycle. So, for every Nvidia. For every AMD, there is a Cisco, and yeah. there is an IBM, or there is a, uh, I'm trying to think, Intel, right? And these are great companies, okay, that we're not, I'm not saying Cisco or, or Intel or IBM aren't great companies, but there's a difference between a great company and a great stock. And, you know, Cisco stock, I think, is about the same price. It's probably lower than it was during the dot-com bubble. Um, I think IBM might have now recovered to where it was during the dot-com bubble. And uh, Intel, I think, is nowhere close. So, you know, they're, each recession, each cycle will have most likely new leadership. And so, you know, the question is, is if and when we get another recession, because we will, you know, when everything looks bad, when you feel horrible, when you want to sell all your stocks, resist that urge, you know, there are tools everywhere now. They're free. You don't have to have a Bloomberg. You can, you can go on the internet and do some of the screens. You can come to our website and see kind of how we analyze stocks. You recreate some of them. They're, the basic ones are pretty basic. You yeah. can screen on sales and margins yeah. and look for those companies. But no, um, for every NVIDIA, there's probably 20 or 30 Intel Cisco's that, you know, that would be a good outcome because the dot-com bubble, a lot of those stocks never saw $10 again. You know, they, they yeah. had their highs in March of 2000, <laughs> right. and no one talks about them ever yeah. nowadays. That's right. So, you got anything else, Eric, or, you know? Yeah, that makes me think about, like, uh, I read one of Warren Buffett's books, and he was like, he invests in he looks at the management of the people that are running the company. Yeah, I mean, and... and, and I don't know how to gauge, you know, a, a management team. Um, Warren Buffett gets special access to these people, right? I mean, I don't, I don't get that access. Um, had I been able to gauge uh, managements, you know, even better than I think I can, you know, I wouldn't. I would have probably bought Amazon stock because I was able to. I sat down with Jeff Bezos during his IPO roadshow in um, whatever that was, 2000. I think it was around 99 or something like that. I don't. I don't remember the exact date, but I sat down with him, you know, and I was like, this is a great story. Um, but the problem with that, at least in the technology side, is even Amazon with its now, is it two trillion or not quite? It's not yeah. in the two trillion, yeah. is it? Yeah, I think it's quite, it's almost Okay, it, it may be one of the two trillion dollar market gap companies out there. If it's not, you know, I'm sorry, Jeff Bezos. But even with sitting <laughs> down with him and, and believing in Amazon and the, the world being the internet, Amazon stock went from something like 100 to 3 during the internet bubble collapse, right? I mean, it, it was down over 95%, and it stayed down 
um, substantially until essentially, I think, you know, years afterwards. It might have been even after the great financial crisis where it really started its, its journey higher. So um, you have to, you're going to have to be patient, you know. Yeah. Um, and in being patient, you, you need to make sure the company has a good balance sheet, meaning that the companies themselves can survive during a downturn, during a recession. They don't have too much debt. The bank doesn't call them up saying, hey, you know, we, we, you need to do more equity deals and dilute your shareholders. So, you know, I, I don't know. If I, if, I, if I knew the answer to that question, too, I'd, you know, be the next Warren Buffett. And I'm, I'm certainly not him. You know, I'm just, we're trying our best as a team. You know, Charles, myself, Dwayne, um, Chris, who's, who's Chris uh, Myrick, who is kind of our, um, what would he be? In a kitchen. Oh, he, like a sous chef, maybe? Or, he probably a sous yeah, chef. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, or, you know, prep. You know, yeah. uh, Chris um, has been at Oak Harvest 10 years, and he transitioned over to the investment team, and he is instrumental in helping James, who's doing almost all of our trading currently, yeah. and very much responsible for the operations uh, working smoothly and the pipes working smoothly because this new mutual fund is complex in the yeah. way we run it. Um, you know, Chris uh, is probably the, the jack of all trades, sous chef behind the scenes. The prep, yeah, yeah he's kind helping of prep. me out in certain things too. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 kind of prep. So, yeah. you know, we all were a team. There's five of us. Um, we're up from two uh, just a year ago. Um, we did it because we know we need depth um, at all the positions. Um, you know, there was some concern at one point in time, you know, what happens if Chris gets hit by a Tesla? We've solved that problem. <laughs> you know, Charles has equal experience that I do. and has been fantastic in his career. Yeah. Um, you know, people have asked about James, you know, what happens if James, who is our head, head trader as well as operation, you know, gets hit by a bus. We bought, brought in Dwayne and Chris yep. is growing into that position. So we're a very deep team now, um, whereas in the past we were very, we were small. We're now deep, um, very still much entrepreneurial and bringing that institutional framework to an RIA, we're currently managing about eight hundred million dollars. That's about right. You know, yeah. um, which I think is fantastic. Up from I think it was fifty-five million when I started about six years ago. So um, incredible, Russ. You got anything else in closing? You want to say to your friends, family? You want to say hi to your family? Hello, and, family. <laughs> <laughs> first no, time on YouTube. It's, it's great being here. Thanks for having me over. I'm learning a whole lot about grills today. Grills. So I'm I'm ready to maybe you know step up to get the. The, what do you get, call this one? The pellet. This is a, so I've got a pellet. The I've got, pellet. as you can this, see, this one is uh, really intriguing right yeah. here because I, I'm, I haven't, I've heard of these, but I didn't really know exactly how they operated. So you're giving me a little bit of a lesson in that. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a barbecue addict. Um, it's rodeo <laughs> week, you know, so I am grilling for the office. They don't know it yet, so I'll probably send an email <laughs> out today. But as you can tell, like I said, I, I've got two Kamados back there, and there's a, there's a pig pit behind all of this that I built about two years ago during COVID that I've yet to roast a full pig, but that's in the to-do list. The I'm, gonna, I'm gonna recruit some people from Oak Harvest <laughs> and have you sit, sit out here. We'll probably drink a few drinks overnight and watch it and tell some stories. And then you know, 10 years from now, tell our kids and grandkids the night we cooked a pig in the backyard <laughs> at Chris's. So um, from the whole family here at Oak Harvest, from myself, from Dwayne, Charles, uh, Chris, and James on the investment team, and from Eric behind the cameras who doesn't get as much accolades as he needs. Have a blessed weekend.